gosh. Right. Okay. I think that starts us off, maybe. I'll just wait for everyone to join. That looks like that's just happened. Um, welcome to everyone, um, both to you on here on Zoom and those uh, watching on Facebook Live. Um, and to those watching in the future, obviously. Uh, my name is Marie and I am a former student at the SOAS Economics Department and I will be the chair of today's event. Today's event is uh, a part of the current SOAS Economics webinar series, which is called Intensifying Inequalities and the Limitations of Global Capitalism. This series aims at bringing together perspectives that extend, that extend our understanding of how inequalities take root in our societies and economies and how these relate to the crises of global capitalism. These include contributions on feminist economics, racial inequalities, and economic imperialism. The series is organized by SOAS Economics Department in collaboration with the students in the Open Economics Forum, uh, the SOAS Feminist Economics Network, and the Black Economist Network. Um, the topic specific to today is paying for the pandemic, fighting class by fighting COVID-19. Um, today's main speaker is Ben Tippett. Uh, ben Tippett is an, is an educator, activist and author. He's currently doing a PhD in economics at the University of Greenwich. Uh, he's researching where he's researching the causes of wealth inequality in the UK alongside uh, working for the Transnational Institute. He also co-founded the London Learning Cooperative, uh, which is a radically inclusive, uh, internationalist and anti-imperialist uh, tuition agency connecting students wanting to learn languages with tutors in formerly and currently colonized societies like Palestine, Pakistan, Ireland, and Venezuela. Um, we'll also have an inter intervention by Aisha Thomas-Smith. Uh, Aisha is the director of movement building at NEON. She is currently doing a PhD at Goldsmiths University at London, where she is looking at neoliberalism and social justice work. In 2017, she also co-founded KIM, which is a network for black activists working for collective liberation. Aisha presents the NEF's weekly economics podcast, uh, economics with subtitles for BBC R4 and the Y Factor for BBC World Services, or World Service. Um, the order of the session is as follows. I will give the floor to Ben in a second, and then he will give his presentation, which will be around 40 minutes. And then we'll hear from Aisha. Uh, and then finally, we will uh, spend the rest of the session on a Q&A. And for this last bit, we obviously need all of your questions. So feel free to post as many as you want in the chat box here on Zoom. And I think that's all from me now. So Ben, the floor is yours. Brilliant, thanks so much, Mary. Thanks for that introduction. Uh, let me just share my PowerPoint screen with you guys. Uh, give me two secs. So hopefully you can see that. Actually, what I should do is Put it on a slideshow. Nice, great. Okay, so hopefully you should be able to see that. Um, so the presentation I'm going to give today it comes out of a report uh, that I just released with the Transnational Institute. Its uh, title is "Paying for the Pandemic and a Just Transition." The just to give you a brief outline, oh, okay, actually, that's slightly weird that it's coming in. We'll go with whatever random order it's coming out with here. So um, this is just an out outline of what the talk's going to say. So we'll start off with an introduction uh, and the head headline result from the report. I'll then talk you through uh, the scope of the report. Uh, and then through each uh, section that I look at. So I first uh, outline what I think the kind of costs of the pandemic and the spending that we need for a just transition are. And then uh, I'll outline what I consider to be these kind of progressive proposals uh, and finish with some conclusions and last steps in moving forward. So really, you know, why this question? Why do we need to talk about paying for the pandemic? So in the process actually writing the report, I had a discussion with the editor who lives in California. And he was describing the situation, it was, it was kind of around September and he was describing the situation uh, in his hometown where he lived in California. And at the time, basically California had had the worst forest fires on record. 
which basically meant if you tried to leave your house, you know, you, you couldn't because the smoke in the air was so intense that it, would, that it would kind of clog up your lungs and you had to go back inside. Well, at the same time, you had the pandemic, the pandemic that meant, you know, if you wanted to leave your house and meet anyone else from another household inside, you risked uh, catching and spreading the disease. And it just struck me that really, even in the richest state of the most powerful country in the world, its citizens were caught between these crises, you know, kind of a spreading pandemic uh, amongst a spreading wildfire. Now, obviously, not everyone has suffered equally when it comes to the pandemic. And even within California, we were just discussing this a little bit before we even started the call actually, but even in California, uh, because of the lack of the, the, the over the lack of capacity really within the firefighting service and the way in which the public firefighting service had been gutted in the state, the, uh, the, 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 the state of California effectively relies on nearly 40% of its workforce to be from prison inmates. So that's what these guys are here, um, just kind of trudging up the hill. And they do this for, for literally $1 uh, an hour. So you have these kind of intense class inequalities that, that are being exacerbated by these crises. But also if you look at the bottom picture, what you see here is Bangladesh. So at the same time that California was on fire, Bangladesh uh, had suffered one of the worst floodings in its history. A third of the country was underwater. And it was trying to do this at the time that it was also uh, fighting the virus, imposing lockdowns. And this really shows the fact that these crises um, you know, it, they're, they're global in reach, but they obviously entrench the inequalities that previously exist. And so I think in order to, to tackle this, what we need in the words of Jayati Gersh is a global multicolored New Deal. Red to tackle the extreme wealth and income inequalities that exist in our society. And also to fight back against the class war that is really being waged against people green to fight against the ecological breakdown, the climate change and other pressures that we're putting on the environment um, are causing, uh, effectively breaking down our life support systems. And purple to put the care work that has been so central in terms of fighting the pandemic at the center of, uh, at the center of our economies. Now, due to the unprecedented state spending that has already occurred with the, the pandemic and also the fact of you know how how are we going to fight all these things the, the big question that we're starting to see increase more and more and, and being asked more and more is the question of who is going to pay for all this you know how are we going to fund this you see this today so much in the uk with the spending review the murmurs of an austerity narrative coming back the idea that public sector workers can't get a pay increase because we don't have enough money because the money's not there and that's really the question i'm trying to tackle uh with this report. And the, the, the kind of overarching result is that when you add up the spendings that we need to take over the next 10 years to fight climate change, to repay the debts of the pandemic, uh, to pay for the sustainable development goals, and also to tackle some uh, of the big issues of reparations for US slavery we end up with an estimated spend of around $9.41 trillion a year. When the income from, uh, but you know, this is a huge amount. I, in fact, global GDP is roughly around $87.7 trillion. So this is uh, just over 10% of global GDP. Now, in order to fight this, I think we do actually have the resources to do it. And the it's so on the right panel here, we have the income from 10 different proposals that I'm going to talk to you about today, which uh, together are enough to cover these costs. Now, let me just, so what we'll move to now is the scope of the report. I mean, what I do is I basically take pre-existing proposals. So these aren't new proposals from my perspective, they're pre-existing proposals from academics and think tanks that um, already exist. 
I focus on a 10 year horizon. So what we're looking at here and with those headline figures is not kind of going infinitely into the future because really it doesn't, I don't think we can really talk about uh, estimated costs much beyond a kind of 10 year horizon. And also because of the fact that the sustainable development goals and also uh, a lot of the, the, the climate um, investments that we need are, are up to 2030. So I think a 10 year horizon is a good way to look at this. Uh, the other kind of, kind of limitation of the report is that these are static. So I don't really look at the interaction between the different proposals. I'm just looking at kind of statically how they might uh, add up to an aggregate figure. Uh, and the last kind of limitation, I guess, is that I don't discuss how to reallocate across countries. I take the most global estimates I can uh, because I'm trying to kind of look at the aggregate level of the globe, whether we have enough resources to do this and what kind of policies are out there. And I think in a future work, I'll, I'll be looking more at the mechanisms of how political mechanisms, I guess, of how these could be re reallocated across countries. So let's move on to the costs of the pandemic and spending for a just transition. So there's six spending or costs, depending on how you want to understand them. The first two relate specifically to COVID. So the first one is uh, to really pay back the fiscal measures that have already been announced by governments across the world. We would need to repay around $1.24 trillion per year over the next 10 years. Now look, this includes repaying back all of the debts and the principal, all of the debts plus interest. So this is the principal plus interest on global debts. Now, do we actually need to do that? Almost certainly not. Um, the IMF even agrees that really we shouldn't be paying down debts at the moment. You know, interest rates are, are at an historic low, uh, particularly for countries in the global north. There's the ability to uh, finance spending through uh, monetizing forms of debts. And even in that case, you know, when you've had big shocks of public budgets in the past from wars, um, from uh, other kind of crises, really these debts can be paid back over a long period of time. So in a way, this, this first one is an overestimation probably of what we would need to do in the next 10 years. But even so, I think it's, it's still important to look at it and, and have it in there. Uh, spending two is, well, I mean, the spending two is basically who's actually been taking this unprecedented levels of state spending when, when, when we look at spending one, it's, it's predominantly being countries in the global north. Uh, for a variety of reasons, countries in the global south have been prevented from, from having the same level of injection. Uh, part of the fact is that they're, the debt levels are already too high. They don't have the ability to uh, print money to service their debts in the same way that we do in the global north because a lot of the debt is held as external foreign debt. So according to uh, UNCTAD and the IMF, the global south needs the equivalent of 283 billion a year over the next 10 years to combat COVID and its immediate economic impacts. In theory, this would be handed out today as uh, effectively 2.5 trillion. And then what I do is I spread that out over 10 years at uh, given some kind of weighted average of a given uh, world interest rate. So spending three, um, this is the upper end of the big estimates of how much we might need to decarbonize the global economy. This includes things like uh, decarbonizing the energy infrastructure, the transport infra infrastructure, and these estimates come from the IMF and um, the World Bank. So there's there's a little bit of spread. There's some uh, I think maybe go slightly over three trillion. Some that are much below it. Um, but I've chosen a kind of more upper level estimate here of three trillion. Spending four is uh, again from similar uh, organisations, the IMF and the UN. If if you want to see the sources for these, um, then go to the the report and it it, it outlines everything there. Again, um, it's estimated at three trillion per year. Spending five, now this is the first, I, this in, introduces the idea of reparations. 
So in my research, I could only really find estimates just for the US alone. So this would, you know, underrate them under, depending on what kind of regime of reparations we would want, any kind of global regime of reparations would obviously uh, come in at a higher cost to this. But for the US, there's estimates that put it at around 15 trillion. If you add up effectively all of the lost hours of uh, work, basically you, what you take is you take the wage rate at the time that there was chattel slavery in the US. Um, you times it by an estimate of how many hours uh, were worked by slaves. And then you um, add a kind of interest rate to take into account inflation of 3%. And you come up with these quite wide ranging figures, but the upper estimate of that was 15 trillion. And the last one, the last kind of big uh, investment or spending is the need to pay for climate reparations. So obviously we started the talk with the discussion of Bangladesh. There's a whole range of lower middle income countries where the costs from loss and damages that are, are gonna be faced over the next few years are astronomical. And I think because of the historic injustice of climate change, you know, the fact that uh, the countries who are suffering the biggest brunt of it are the ones who are historically the least responsible. There needs to be put in place some kind of global reparations redistribution mechanism. Um, and the estimate here, 300 billion, comes from an estimate of how much the loss and damages are going to be per year over the next 10 years for countries in um, low and middle income countries. So that's the cost side of things or the spending side of things. How about the proposals? Well, th this um, figure to the right has the proposals and it has it uh, proportional to the size of how much revenue we expect them to bring in. Now, the whole point of this really is that it's supposed to be designed to make those with the broadest shoulders pay. And it's an interesting one, whenever you talk about raising money to pay for things, you face some, I think, some strong criticisms to say, this isn't the right time to be talking about this. You know, we shouldn't be talking about paying off debts. We shouldn't be talking um, in that narrative because it will justify the way to austerity. And I think that, that there is, there's obviously truth to that. You know, I don't think we should be necessarily talking right now about paying, the, paying down the debts. But this idea of printing money or getting into more debt in the global north isn't, I think, sufficient for progressives uh, for three reasons. The first is that there's a debt crisis happening in the global south right now. And getting into more debt in the global north, put it, just putting forward progressive proposals to deal with that does nothing to solve that crisis. And if anything, potentially makes that crisis worse because of the relationship between things like QE and debt crises in the global south, which again, you can look into a little bit more if you go to the report. The second thing is the, this is, this is, you know, a real opportunity, I think, to shape the discourse. This is an opportunity, when we say how will we pay for the pandemic or who will pay for the pandemic, what we're really talking about is who will the post-crisis economy work for? And as progressives, we have to obviously put forward a set of proposals that I think both raises money to pay for the things we need, but also that tackles inequality, that tackles militarism, colonialism, and climate change. And so what these proposals do is show that we do have the resources to pay for the things we want, while at the same time tackling these things. So there's 10 proposals. I'm gonna go through each one. What is the time? I'm just trying to, okay. So I've got, I've got uh, enough time to, to talk through each one in some uh, substantial de depth. So the first one is uh, a global wealth tax could raise 4.4 trillion a year. 
Now, the source for this comes from Piketty's new book, Thomas Piketty, the French economist's new book, um, Capital and Ideology. I'll go a little bit into the mechanics in a sec, but I think it's important to think about what the justification for such a world tax could be. I mean, the first one is the fact that in, there's obviously increasing wealth inequality. The global top 1% own about as much wealth as the bottom 88% of the population. So we have an extreme distribution of wealth. And we know that this wealth is increasing, uh, this inequality, sorry, is increasing over time. The second is that there's also, I mean, maybe this inequality wouldn't be a problem if everybody had a basic standard of living, everybody had the goods and services that they needed to survive. As I'm sure you all know, this isn't the case. And the pandemic itself is threatening to push half a billion people into, into poverty. And I think that, so, so really, given the fact that there's such extreme poverty and the pandemic is making this worse, while at the same time increasing wealth inequality, uh, increasing the wealth of people at the top, really justifies the intervention by governments to do something about this. And the third thing is that there's increasing public support for wealth taxes. Uh, the inheritance tax, which is the UK's only existing tax at the moment, uh, only existing wealth tax at the moment, is one of the most unpopular taxes. And this has always been used as a way to say, you know, people aren't, don't really want to tax on the stock of wealth. But really, recent polling shows that actually introducing new progressive wealth taxes that predominantly increase taxes on the rich is by far the most popular way to raise money to pay for the, the COVID debts. And part of the reason is because, uh, at least for the UK public, at least, they know that this will decrease wealth inequality. So, you know, this is very much on the agenda, I think. And the issue has gone from in 2012 being ridiculed, I think, as being uh, an unserious proposition to now having commissions across uh, lots of countries in the world. You had the Davis Commission in South Africa. You have the, the Wealth Tax Commission by the IFS here, who are really seriously thinking about implementing these things. Now, there's a couple of problems, I think, with implementing a global wealth tax. One is that there's no global tax collector, right? So we, we'd need some kind of coordination mechanism uh, to make sure that all countries were implementing a similar level of tax. Now, that, that's, that is an ambitious thing to do, which makes this estimate, I think, something that not, you know, it's not a proposal we could implement tomorrow, but it's definitely something we should be putting out there uh, in order to build the institutions to build towards it. Now, the second big things that people raise about wealth taxes are, well, one is the, the rich will just pack up their bags and leave. Um, so they'll just evade the tax. This is why I think we need a global wealth tax uh, based on a, a global wealth tax registers. And some of the other proposals I'll discuss will um, deal with this as well. The other big issue is liquidity. So do if you put wealth taxes on stocks of wealth, people might not have the income uh, in order to, to repay. And I was, I was listening to an interesting uh, historical account of the fact that one of the reasons why the wealth tax failed in the UK in 1990, 1975, when they tried to implement it, were it, it was partly because um, they really cemented in the public eye the image of the like crumbling down uh, big estate you know, the idea that we kind of imagine the aristocracy to be in these massive estates and they're falling down and they don't have any income. This idea was really created at the last time that they tried to implement a wealth tax as a way of really cementing the idea that like, if you try and stock, uh, tax the stock of wealth, what you'll do is you'll just destroy the heritage of the country. And I think this is a problem we need to think about when we implement wealth taxes. Like we need to, I think that will rear its head again and any design has to overcome something like that. That said, I don't think these are insurmountable problems. I mean, you deal with liquidity issues by creating financial products to deal with it. Um, I don't think it's, it, it's or, you, or you implement it on death. You know, there's, there's ways of dealing with this. Okay, so that, that's some of the, the justifications and problems with the wealth tax. What actually, how do I get this 4.417 trillion a year? I mean, the precision here is probably a little bit silly. Like, can we pre precisely say that? I don't know. I probably should have rounded that up. But anyway, um, it's a classic case of economists talking like 
very precisely, even though, uh, you know, they might get the, the precision, uh, the, the, the focus on precision over other factors maybe. So, but, but basically the way that the wealth tax works is, is progressive. So the bottom 90% of the wealth distribution the poorest 90% of households will be taxed at a very low rate of about 0.5%. Even within that, you could have that rate ranked so that some people weren't taxed at all and the top, you know, 80% to 90% were taxed at a higher rate. Uh, the next 10 to so the top 10% are taxed at 1%. The richest 1% of households are taxed at a 5% rate and the very richest 0.1% households are taxed on average at 10%. Again, at the very top, you might tax billionaires at 80% because we think that a society with uh, billions of people in poverty shouldn't, ex billionaires shouldn't exist in such a society. And therefore, this would raise the effective tax rate for those who are just at the threshold. So, proposal two brings in the offshoring discussion, the, the, the problem of won't the rich just run away and hide their wealth? I think therefore what we need to do is we need to shut down tax havens and tax the offshore private wealth of individuals at current rates. So this estimate comes from Zuckman, Gabriel Zuckman from 2014, which does make it slightly old. And I'll, I'll come back to a slightly more updated version that came uh, out last week after I'd released the report. But basically what we say is that if you tax the income from wealth, so, you know, if you have capital, it generates income at current rates, this is how much you could be raising. Now, again, what's the justification for this? Well, the richest people tend to be the ones that hide their wealth offshore. We see this from uh, this paper here. The second is that we have to close down tax havens um, in order to implement any of the, the taxes that I'm talking about. Otherwise, they won't be effective. And I think a first step towards doing this would be to set out a global ad asset register. Um, I'll come back in a sec to some of the progress I think that's been made in terms of tax evasion and offshoring. Over the in terms of tackling tax evasion and offshoring over the last few years. Proposal three. So, so the first two proposals look at individual wealth. So the, the wealth of rich individuals in our society. The, the, these proposals now look at corporate profits and income. So there's this idea that's floating around of the kind of windfall profit tax or the excess profit tax. You know, like a one-off tax or a repeated tax that lasts for like a, a, a set period of time on the most profitable companies in the world. The According to Oxfam, an excess profit tax on the 32 most profitable comp global companies this year would raise 104 billion a year. So these are the, the kind of pandemic profiteers, people like Amazon, Google, Apple, they only focus on the 32 most profitable ones. Another justification for this is the fact that corporate profits are very unequally distributed. You know, one, one thing that you tend to hear is whenever you talk about taxing corporations is that, well, you're just taxing your pension fund or you're taxing this kind of shareholder democracy that exists. Well, the data that we have countries for like the US, basically the top 10% take something like 89% of corporate profits. So again, very unequally distributed in terms of an income source. The other big justification for this, which is interesting, is the fact that we've done it before. So after the world, after World War One, after World War Two, after the Korean War, excess profits were taxed at inc incredibly high rates, eighty to ninety-five percent. I should have said that the Ox, this Oxfam statistics, I think, has a tax rate of ninety-five percent. So we've done it before in periods of crisis. I don't see why we shouldn't uh, we shouldn't do it again. Why why people should be able to profit from a pandemic, particularly when the high street is dying, and when again so many people have been pushed into poverty. Proposal four 
looks at, again, the offshore version of the corporate profit. So we looked at individual wealth and we looked at a wealth tax and uh, the offshoring of individual wealth. This is now looking at corporate offshoring, which is much bigger, actually. Now, I, here I wanted to, so, so the, the figures range quite dramatically. Obviously, we don't, we can't see the wealth. So, so we can't see the offshore profits. So we don't know exactly how much there is and how much could be taxed if uh, these profits were brought into the, into the light. The, the upper estimate of this comes from the IMF from 2015. Now, could we ever do this? You know, could we ever shut down tax havens and tax these tax these things? I mean, it would require huge international cooperation. I think there is some precedent for it. I think particularly since the Panama Papers have come out, since austerity has kind of woken up public consciousness to the fact that the the tax system is unfair. You've had in the UK groups like um, uh, Tax Justice Network. Um, you've had the big anti-austerity movements that have really kind of shone a light on this. I think there's been some progress at the international level. In the US in 2010 implemented the Foreign Account Tax Compliance Act. This is basically an automatic exchange of data between foreign banks and the US Internal Revenue Service. In 2014, this was kind of internationalized by the G20 and the OECD. And they have been doing a lot of work on this thing called BEPS, which is base erosion and profit shifting. Basically the idea that if you're Apple, you can shift your profits around to low tax havens. How do we, how do we stop that from happening? Um, they've come up with some interesting facts and statistics and proposals around this stuff. One of their things that they're talking about as well is this idea that you can have routine versus non-routine profits, which people are saying could be the basis of an excess profit tax. This is kind of all good. And I think it shows that if there's political will, then stuff can be done about this. That said, these reforms do have some problems. I mean, one is that they generally exclude low income countries from their arrangements and from the table. And there's a kind of line that I had um, somebody talking about this. Uh, basically, it says, you know, if you're not at the table, you are on the menu. I think summarizes actually how quite a lot of international organization, international coordination around these things work. Uh, and the second thing is that they still leave a considerable amount of wealth and profits still hidden offshore. So they definitely don't go far enough, but it shows that whenever somebody says, we can't do anything about tax evasion, actually we can. And with a small amount of political will, quite a lot has already been done. The Tax Justice Network came out last week with an estimate adding together all forms of tax evasion and how much they think governments lost from it. They come up with a lesser figure than mine, 427 billion rather than the 725 billion, which is basically adding proposal four and two. But anyway, that's some technical details. I think the point is there's a lot of money that could be raised from this. What, how much time have I got? I think I've got 10 minutes, is that right? Yeah, you've got 10 minutes left. Brilliant, all right, okay. So then we can whiz through the last, the last uh, five proposals. Stick, stick with me, I know 10's, 10's, 10's I guess like a, I mean, it sounds like it's made up for a marketing thing. It kind of wasn't, it just came out like this. Um, so the financial transaction tax, this is an idea that came out of, I guess it became prominent after the, global financial crisis. The idea is that you have like very small rates of tax on the trades of different financial instruments. Partly it's about trying to stop like toxic financial trading. It's also about trying to raise money for governments. I think in a, in a way this is almost more, but there's more of a justification to do it now because then the financial sector were, was in a, obviously in a dire situation. Now it's, well, potentially it's in, it, it, it might be in a worse situation. We don't really know yet, but it's incredibly supported by public money. So this tax could be justified along the sense of we need to reclaim some of this public money back. That said, when the EU tried to implement a financial transaction tax, 
in the kind of, uh, I can't remember the exact date, but 2013, 2014, it basically was stopped by extremely heavy lobbying by the financial sector. So I think this raises a question, how do we overcome lobbying by specific interest groups in order to get any of this, done, this stuff done, particularly when you're talking about this stuff at kind of international level or regional levels like the EU, where representation by civil society groups, by trade unions, is just a, a, a tiny fraction of the lobbying representation that happens by big business. Proposal six, in eliminating public subsidies to the fossil fuel industry and implementing a tax on the cost of pollution could raise an extra 3.2 trillion a year. So this is, I mean, this comes in because of the fact that we really need to decarbonize and implementing, changing our public subsidies to the fossil fuel in industry and implementing a tax on fossil fuels I think is gonna have to be an inevitable part of our process towards decarbonization. Now, direct subsidies by governments across the world is in the region of 200 to 400 billion a year. So the rest of this 3.2 trillion, you'll be thinking that's a lot more than 400 billion. It comes from the tax on fossil fuels. And this, this all comes from a paper from the IMF from last year. Now, you know, we know about the Gilets Jaunes. You might know about the protests in Ecuador. When you try and tax carbon or tax fossil fuels, and if not properly designed, it can end up hitting the poorest households the hardest and can end up with a, a, a revolt that will effectively make the policy both unfair and completely inefficient and ineffective. So building what, what, you know, this has to be done alongside building publicly owned, democratically organized renewable energy and providing sufficient social welfare so that people's incomes aren't massively, uh, at the bottom of the population aren't massively hit. So if you wanna look at some proposals for that, uh, go to the report, go to a, a great book by TNI by a guy called Oscar Reyes where he looks at some of the ways in which we could do this. I think it's important to say here that the richest 20% of households currently receive around six times more in subsidies than the poorest 20%. So even, even though there's this kind of, there's the, we need to implement pro proposals to deal with the impacts of, you know, getting rid of the subsidies and taxing fossil fuels, what, the, the current system is not working for the poor. It's not working for the people going out in gilets jaunes protests or the people who are going on, uh, in protest against similar reforms in Ecuador. So I think reform is definitely needed. Again, you know, this is a 10 year process. So anything we do, you know, you can't tax, you can't raise this amount of money forever. This is gonna slowly kind of whittle down uh, and I think this again is why we can only discuss these reforms within a 10 year process, because after that, hopefully, we'll only be making a fraction of this amount um, because the use of fossil fuels will be quite quickly um, substituted away from. Proposal seven looks at another social problem, which is, I think, the problem of excessive military spending. I mean, I think heterodox economists or progressive economists tend not to really think too much about this. Maybe it's partly to do with the fact that, like, some of the big works that's done in kind of post Keynesianism tends to be focused. I mean, it, it tends to have a kind of interesting role for the military. You know, the military is like a source of innovation if you read. Mariana Mazzucato's book, This Entrepreneurial State, or, you know, the US military was a big kind of source of demand and, and Keynesian stimulus to do with the, the, the Roosevelt New Deal. I think we need to realize though, that when you, you know, when you, the, the, the destruction that's caused by excessive military spending, particularly, I guess, by US, uh, US kind of neo-imperialism 
um, we need to have a more critical perspective on this. And I think the pandemic has kind of given us space to talk about this. You know, it, we have a broader understanding of human security. You know, you can't tame a pandemic through the barrel of a gun. And despite the fact that the pandemic has been discussed in a discourse and narrative of war, what, what you see is that actually um, the real threats to human security can't really be dealt with by this, by this defense spending. Now, I'd say if we reclaim 10% of global military expenditure, this could kind of free up around 200 billion a year globally. Uh, this comes from a report by, oh, I think it's called Cip Cipri, who are the um, Stockholm uh, Peace Research Initiative. Now, if you think that's utopian, What's interesting is that some countries are already starting to do this. South Korea said it will trim next year's defense budget by 2%, Thailand by 8%, with the money going instead to a disaster relief fund and a stimulus package. That said, if you've been following the news in the UK recently, you've realized that our government is doing the opposite and has uh, increased uh, military spending. So this is something that we'd need to campaign on. There's definitely big calls of global campaigning on this. Uh, Bernie Sanders, for example, has been um, pushing for, for this in the US. Uh, you have three minutes left, Ben. Okay, I've, I've overshot it. So let me quickly go through the last proposals. So this really is dealing, the last proposals are dealing with the debt crisis that I discussed at the beginning of the talk. So 64 countries at the moment uh, in the global south are currently paying more in debt servicing than on healthcare, or at least they were at the beginning of the pandemic. I think this is the legacy of neoliberal policies and colonial inequality. What we need to do in the global south is in the global, well, as an international community is implement some debt jubilees. So the write-off of debts. Uh, the G20 has done this to an extent uh, this month. It's come up with this idea of the common framework, but it's been criticized be, by not including private creditors. And I think it's interesting because the World Bank, the president of the World Bank, has called these private creditors and their role in the international debt system, the modern equivalent of debtors prison. So really it's not dealing one of, with one of the big actors that is holding these countries in the global South to ransom. If you wanna look at this, I would go to Ulrich uh, Voltz's interesting report, who I think isn't so as academic on uh, debt cancellation where he sets out a proposal for this. Proposal nine is looking at special drawing rights. Um, basically special drawing rights is the IMF's own international currency. It works a little bit like a gift voucher. I can, it's maybe the best way of thinking about it, or maybe it's not quite good. If you give somebody a gift voucher, they can use it to exchange it for goods and services that frees up money that they can use to pay for other things like their debts or for um, other services. So. You know, in a way, it, it, if, if you issue these out and give it to countries in the global south, they can use it to, to solve some of their budget constraints. The managing director of the IMF has claimed that this isn't off the table. That said, it's been blocked by the US at the IMF who have a veto power, partly because of the fact that it will undermine the standing of the dollar in the international system. Obviously, if you create like a new I mean, it's not the creating a new international currency, but if you increase the relevance of that currency, it will undermine the ability for the Fed to act as international lender of last resort. And the last one is a Marshall Plan. This is effectively aid. So we could give more aid uh, in the global north to countries in the global south. I think it's interesting that today, one of the big headline things of the, of the spending review is that the UK Chancellor, though, is going to cut our uh, budget, uh, the aid budget is seen as not, you know, there, there's, they're really pitching the interests of people, the working class in the global north against the working class in the global south. Okay, so the last section is looking just, I, I think, you know, how possible are these? I mean, I've talked you through some of the feasibility of some of these proposals. I personally think anything is possible if there's the political will to do it. And what, we, what I'm trying to show is that, you know, we can pay for the pandemic and much more, but if 
countries work together. The pandemic is exposed the costs of a deeply unequal world, but it's also shown that radical, quick, swift action is possible. There's that line, there are decades where nothing happens and there are weeks where decades happen. And I think that is really what the pandemic shows. Hopefully it's a message that people won't forget as potentially the new normal sets in. The last point is though that whenever you change taxes or systems of funding, the iron law, this is a quote by Gus O'Donnell, who was the chief, the, the head of the British civil service during the Blair years. He said, the iron law of a tax change is that the losers scream. And really what we then need is an international movement that understands that, you know, cap, that these, the people who are screaming are gonna be the most powerful people in the world, the most powerful corporations in the world. They're global. Our solutions need to be too. And I think the way that you do that is by building the a more international uh, a more international movement that links these things up. Brilliant. So if you want to look at further resources, this is just a link to my book where I discuss class inequality, uh, the report, and an article I recently summarised my uh, report in the Guardian. Thanks very much. Thank you, Ben. That was exactly 42 minutes of, mm. uh, of the extra two. Well done. Um, <laughs> I'll put a link to the report in the chat box if people want to check it out afterwards. Um, and Aisha, over to you. Uh, thanks. Thanks both. Yeah, Ben, um, that was a really great place to end uh, with the call to uh, for international movement. So that's, I, I guess, where I'll be picking up. Um, so yeah, my work with the New Economy Organizers Network, uh, NEF and others is mainly about building the strength and power of social movements, uh, with a particular focus on building connections between various struggles on the ground and the economic systems that shape our lives. Um, and my academic work is concerned primarily, primarily with the socio-cultural ramifications of neoliberalism, um, and its implications for collective political action. So hopefully some of the thoughts that um, I'm sharing from that perspective will be, will be relevant um, to the things that Ben was just laying out, as well as uh, being quite UK focused because that's where my work is based. So just a, um, just a bit of a frame there. So I thought it would probably be um, the most useful thing uh, that I could do would, would be to offer some kind of additional thoughts to supplement uh, Ben's fantastic work, as well as re-emphasizing some of the points in the report and ultimately offering some particular things that I think we should be looking out for um, as we move into a recovery phase. So, you know, as Ben has, has laid out already, the COVID-19 pandemic has exposed many things, but to me, one of the most important and useful takeaways from this moment is that it's shown us that we need to think about the economy in a much broader sense um, and really kind of ask ourselves what and who do we think it should be for. Um, so as we know, uh, the economy isn't just about money, it's pretty much about everything that relates to how we live our lives. It's healthcare, it's housing, migration, childcare, all of these things are really deeply impacted by economic choices. And so our conversation about what economics is should be equally expansive. Um, at NEON and NEF, we were part of some really interesting research called Framing the Economy, um, which I would really recommend folks seek out if you're interested in how people think uh, about the economy. But one of the things that the research revealed is that generally we all have quite a narrow set of cognitive frames when it comes to uh, thinking about um, what the economy could be for. So we, we tend to kind of see it as a bucket um, with a finite amount of resources that good people put into um, and bad people take out of. So that's the kind of scroungers, strivers narrative that's really kind of embedded there um, in, uh, in the cognitive frames. But COVID has kind of started to create, I think, a bit of a wedge there in showing that it that we can, in fact, think of the economy as a system which we have control over and we can, in fact, reprogram around some of the things that we care about. Um, crucially, it's also shown us, uh, as Ben uh, emphasised, that austerity was always a political choice rather than an economic necessity. And that's going to be really vital when it comes to planning where we go from here. Um, so the main things that I'd like to highlight today are around the, firstly, the disproportionate impact of so many of our economic policies uh, on people of colour. 
from austerity to climate change to COVID and beyond that. Um, and some of the other things uh, I'll be talking about are what I, we, what I think we need to be vigilant against when it comes to organizing for a just recovery. Um, but before I do that, just a few more points to lift up. So um, I would yeah, wholeheartedly agree with uh, Ben's analysis in Split, which I would really recommend everyone read. It's a great book um, and the report uh, and the proposals it laid out. And I think that it's really vital that we go as far as we can in embedding an intersectional approach from top to bottom in how we respond to this. So for example, expanding on the global multicolored New Deal frame, so the red, green and purple, to include black or brown for, for people of color who are dying every day at the hands of state violence, in, entrenched inequality and, and systemic racism. Um, and one more, thing I would say I think is a, is a little bit of a word of, of caution for folks looking to organize around this is that any meaningful class-based analysis or call to action is incomplete without consideration of the ways in which on a cultural level people of color are constructed as subjects over whom predominantly white governors exercise the power to make live or, or let die. Um, the legitimacy of colonialism as a political project was absolutely predicated on this construction of people of color as less than with their proximity to whiteness also uh, used as a way of assigning proximity to humanity. Um, and it's this schema that has enabled the whole scale exploitation of the global south and the ravaging of its resources that still very much continues today. Uh, and this way of thinking that has laid the foundation for a world in which black people are four times more likely to die from COVID-19 than their white counterparts and a world where black and uh, POC lives are still disposable. So I'm gonna go on to talk about just how stark this reality has been in the era of COVID here in the UK. Uh, but in my opinion, it's just to say really that until we're kind of willing to really grapple with some of the cultural and psychosocial legacies of colonialism and the many ways in which they still live within us and within our society, we will be falling short when it comes to kind of building the type of liberatory movements we need to, to win a just recovery. Um, so to go on then to some of these points that I think we need to be we need to be looking out for. So so the first thing, as I said, that I wanted to talk about was the disproportionate impact uh, on people of color, both of the pandemic and potentially paying for it as well. So uh, hopefully I won't need to kind of labor the fact that um, people of color, especially in the UK, but you know worldwide have been disproportionately impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, one report that I did want to lift up that, that speaks to this um, really eloquently is the Runnymede Trust uh, report overexposed and underprotected the devastating impact of COVID-19 on BME communities in Great Britain. Um, and just some of the findings of that report, which, which to me are so important, um, were around the, the, the why, um, behind why certain groups, um, BME groups are more likely to be at risk from COVID-19. So some of those things are, for example, they're more likely to be working outside of the home, they're more likely to be using public transport, um, more likely to be working in key worker roles, uh, and less likely to be pr protected with PPE, even when they ask for it, um, as well as being more likely to live in multi-generational overcrowded housing, so much less able to self-isolate and to, and to shield. Um, other highlights from the report are that more than one third of black communities are in key worker roles. Half of Bangladeshi key workers um, reported that they'd not been supplied with adequate PPE when they asked for it. So, so huge numbers there um, and, and a host of other really important statistics. And there's also some uh, great policy recommendations in that report to, to check out. Um, but I think with with that report and lots of others, um, and with the 2016 research from the Women's Budget Group and the Runnymede Trust indicating that women, people of color, and in particular, women of color had been affected most by austerity. Um, and that by 2020, low income uh, BME women would have lost nearly double the amount of money that working class uh, white men will have. It's really crucial that we factor in thinking about how these pre-existing inequalities um, my impact on how we pay for the pandemic. Um, and beyond that, what a truly just recovery looks like, not just a recovery from COVID, but from the racist, racist impacts of the UK's economic policies for decades. 
Um, and for more on, on that piece in particular, I'd really recommend Gary Young's piece in the New Statesman, We Can't Breathe, um, which is kind of a really fantastic um, expose on, on some of the COVID uh, racial inequalities and more. Um, how am I doing? Okay, so the, the, the other uh, two pieces that I wanted to mention, firstly, austerity. So this was, this is obviously mentioned extensively in the report, but I thought it was important to give a bit more context on why we have to be so wary of a reintroduction of the austerity narrative. So uh, as we all know, the government has created financial support schemes for companies furloughing workers, for some self-employed people, for struggling businesses, as well as increasing the rate of universal credit, expanding housing benefit and more. Um, some of the supporters of austerity, like the former Chancellor Sajid Javid, have claimed that the last decade of cuts is what made this possible, right? That's, that's kind of what enabled the government uh, to respond in this way now. I don't have time to fully debunk this, as painful as that is for me, um, but uh, I, I, I would hazard a guess at saying most people on this call uh, know that not only did austerity fail spectacularly on its own terms um, to reduce the debt to GDP ratio and shrink the deficit, but it also decimated our public services, leaving us in a much weaker position to fight the pandemic in the first place. And we have to remember that. So just to emphasize a few key points, going into 2020, we had 4.1 million children living in poverty. So this is before COVID, a 19% year on year increase in food bank use and a decline in NHS funding over a decade that has taken us back to around the same level of public spending on the NHS than we were in 1984. Um, we have all seen the headlines about public sector salary stagnating, waiting time skyrocketing, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but when it comes to paying for the pandemic and austerity, we have to kind of remember where we were before and watch out for government rhetoric, like George Osborne's famous statement that we have to act to fix the roof while the sun is shining. In other words, we should tighten our belts and reduce spending um, to create more room for borrowing in other, in other times. The conservative, the conservative government have long argued that austerity makes us more resilient when a crisis hits because um, as we've, as they, you know, as as they would argue, we have these kind of lovely roofs that can protect us from the rains and the storms. Um, but COVID has shown us that the roof is made up of more than just the debt to GDP ratio, believe it or not. Um, there's lots of other risks and vulnerabilities that we haven't been protecting ourselves against, uh, which has left us with loads of gaping holes for the rain to to come pouring in when when COVID hit, and it definitely did. Um, on the austerity uh, point, some people would argue that it would be quite difficult for the government to revert to a narrative of austerity, um, thanks Marie, um, when, uh, and claim that there's no magic money tree when they've spent the best part of a year shaking it to, to great effect. But we shouldn't be naive about how easy it would be to fall back on a narrative that says we have to tighten our belts to get things back on track. Um, and again, just to emphasize, we have to remember that and, arg and argue for the fact that government spending and investment creates employment and income. We know this with more economic activity stimulated by government spending plus an appropriate tax system, which is crucial. The government can easily raise the revenue and pay off the debt that it's accumulated without resorting to austerity. Um, and just a final point on this is that we also have to be careful um, when we're talking about austerity and um, that we don't reinforce unhelpful frames that I mentioned at the top, such as the economy as a bucket that good people put into and bad people take out of, or the or the um, the state budget being the same as a household one, for example, because that just kind of paves the way for lots of other really regressive uh, economic and fiscal policies. Um, and as Ben, you know, argued in the presentation, the question of who should pay for the pandemic needs to be expanded, actually, to include questions such as what does paying for it actually mean, right? Which would mean reevaluating things like what a healthy debt to GDP ratio even is. Um, finally, three minutes. Um, the, the last thing I wanted to kind of caution against is a the neoliberalism is dead narrative, which I've kind of heard a little bit. Um, and I think celebrations are sadly premature. Um, while I would agree that some of the values of neoliberalism have been really undermined and that the Overton window has certainly shifted, um, we have to also remember that a lot of the government interventions have been more about workfare than welfare. The main focuses have been businesses and jobs, rather than things like mental health, taking care of vulnerable communities, or investing in support, for example, people facing digital poverty. Um, and this is actually quite aligned with the political project of neoliberalism, which takes full employability as its objectives and encourages humans to see ourselves as small businesses and the economy is reducible to jobs and incomes. 
So we shouldn't be too quick to celebrate, but the sense of collectivism, mutual aid and community that COVID-19 has surfaced is something that we should cling on to and that we should uh, advocate for uh, as we move forward. So just one example of an opportunity that has been presented is um, one of the ways that neoliberal neoliberalism kind of functions as a mode of governing is it makes us see ourselves as entrepreneurs um, and that has led to increasing numbers of middle class people kind of going freelance right as distinct from precarious workers who are people on low incomes and zero hour contracts but the pandemic has demonstrated to precisely that group of middle class freelance workers um, who might have fallen through the cracks in the decimated so social safety net um, the value of things like a secure employment contract, uh, union membership, collective bargaining, not to mention sick pay and other benefits that have been really hard won. Um, and we have to take advantage of that increase in solidarity to organize um, for, for collective rights. So one of the projects we're doing at NEON, for example, is around bringing together precarious workers with those kind of more traditional freelance workers um, to create that space for kind of collective solidarity and, and bargaining for better workers' rights across the piece. Um, but that's just one example of the ways in which we might utilize these learnings from the pandemic to start to chip away at the ideology of, of neoliberalism. Um, so just to wrap up, I've tried to kind of lay out a few of the things that I think we need to have front of mind when we're considering a just recovery. So racism and the legacy of colonialism, a return to austerity, as well as the debate around neoliberalism and, and whether or not it's, it is in fact dead. Um, I'd suggest that there's a lot that we can learn on this from the abolitionist movement in our approach to what comes next. So that would mean building a response that is holistic, long term and revolutionary in its praxis. Um, of course, there are lots of other, the, other things that we need to be aware of, which you know, Ben has touched on, um, and also lots of specific policy proposals beyond uh, the TNI ones that others like NEF and IPPR and Build Back Better uh, have been advancing, which I can maybe speak to a bit more. But for now, um, I'll leave it there and uh, throw it back to you, Marie. Thank you. Uh, and thank you for that important intervention. Um, I'm going to let Ben reply or come in again. I'm going to, just going to ask you to also answer the first question, which is a question of more clarification um, from Jacinth, who asks, or writes, you've mentioned uh, we've done this before when you said that taxes were raised out of the two world wars. Which countries were you referring to? Only the UK or others? And how much impact did it have on the working class in these countries? Um, so yeah, that and then reacting to Aisha's intervention. Great. Um, yeah, firstly, thanks so much for that, Aisha. That was really, uh, I've, I've been like scribbling down all your notes, all your points, because there's so much interesting stuff in there that I'm now like, oh, maybe I can shove this into the report, even though you probably shouldn't edit some work after you published it. Um, right. On the, let me maybe answer the excess profit tax one first. Yeah, just because it's a point of clarification. The excess profit tax was done by the US and the UK. There might be other countries that I know of, but they're the ones I'm definitely sure. So after the Second World War, I think it was done in the UK. And then the Korean War and the First World War, it was done in the US. So yeah, these have been done in, uh, you know, the richest countries in the world on the, the most kind of powerful and profitable com com companies within those countries. And so I don't see why we couldn't do the same thing again now. In terms of how it impacted the workers' movement, I mean, these, this was a different economic, political economic regime than what we have now. I mean, this was particularly, I guess, in the post-war period, there was more of a social contract working class power was more established within uh, within the economy, you know, union rates were higher or were increasing rather than kind of declining, which is what we see now. Uh, there was more collective bargaining. So I do think, I don't know too much about the history exactly, but I can imagine that very much these things come together, don't they? You know, your ability to, to, to pressure the government or to, to, to do these things really does rely on having to some extent an organized working class that can push this um so i hope that that answered answered your question i think in response to 
Uh, Aisha's points. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I guess I don't have time to go through all of them. Let me go. I think the best place to start maybe is on this question of, of austerity. I think we're really, you know, Aisha said that we need to be wary of the reintroduction of austerity and wary of these narratives that, that kind of say that everything's changed, you know, that neoliberalism is over, that because the government has turned on the taps, the money taps now, whatever analogy you want to use, the public will see that actually this exists and, and they won't be able to go back or that the, the, you know, we won the argument on austerity. And I, I think this is really, that there's a kind of confused response, I think, from like the left at the moment about how we respond to this. And I kind of found that even while writing the report and writing these articles that on the one hand, you have this kind of modern monetary theory perspective, which is like, we don't have to do anything. We don't have to pay back the debts. We can just continue to spend as much as possible. And we can fund that with effectively monetizing the debts. No, I personally think that this, as I, sh you know, I should very, um, I think very uh, what summarize really the problems of this, you know, in a way we can't just look at the G debt to GDP ratio. We need a much more broader understanding of the ways in which austerity created and reinforced the pre-existing inequalities. We can't just think, you know, when we talk about austerity, it isn't just about balancing the government's books. It's much broader about this idea of, you know, who the economy works for, who has political power within the economy. And I think that's kind of what I've tried, I guess like that's what I'm trying tried to do with the report, but it's very hard to kind of get that across in a snappy analogy that is as easy as, oh, we need to fix the roof for when the, the rain comes, or, you know, we need to balance the books. I know that Neff have done a lot of work over the last, you know, decade thinking of alternative narratives. And actually I should mentioned uh, like actually some really, uh, some, I think summarize some of these like um, very well within her response. Um, but still, I still see this as a, something that is maybe a weak spot that we need to, that we need to, uh, that we need to kind of continue to work on. Um, about the issue of race, I think, uh, I, you know, it's, it's so interesting that this year, it's just so much has happened, hasn't it? You know, it, this year you've had everything from COVID to even in London, we've had like the, the massive like Black Lives Matter marches that happened, like the biggest um, marches, I'm pretty sure like the biggest mar uh, marches of black people in South London in the history of the city, you know, at the same time as the, all of these other great changes that are happening. I think that this is, I mean, it's, it's, it's so optimistic. I mean, just to give you a personal account, my, my, uh, a family member who was living in a kind of remote town in Devon, who isn't particularly, I mean, who's politically engaged, but like never like actively engaging in politics, went to like really you know th there was a kind of organization of a black lives matter process there and people went down and did a die-in and it just felt like it really sp spread across the country in a way that was like very in light you know very inspiring and very empowering and i think trying to you know any kind of proposals that we talk about here where have to be have to be grounded in that in that um on, on the back of those movements i mean i do think maybe one more one thing that Aisha said that we need to think about as well is if part of the problem with uh, the way in which racism persists is actually this idea of creating a kind of uh, a subject that can kind of that, that, that is controlled and is um, you know, if, if the fact is that the exploitation of black people across the country is to do, uh, across the world is to do with the fact that they don't have like power within political processes, maybe something I think I could do more in the report is 
more about the actual processes of like who sits at the table here. I mean, I guess I talked a bit about this idea that if you're not at the table, then you're on the menu. And maybe we shouldn't be thinking so much about specific proposals, but more about the processes of kind of who actually gets to sit at the table to, to organize these things. Because maybe that's the way in which you actually start to change institutions like the UN and, and the IMF or the OECD and why in a way these these uh, these changes, like for example, around tax evasion that we've seen haven't gone far enough. Um, okay, that, that I think that's probably okay for me. Do, do I respond with questions or do you, what, what happens now? I'll, I'll choose some of the questions for you. Brilliant. <clears throat> that's, that's the power I hold as the chair um, and I'll make Excellent. active use of. Um, so we have some, some questions from both Yanis and, and Sarah and I'm gonna mix it up a little bit and take one from each now because we have around 15 minutes left. Um, and so these two questions go specifically or like more specifically um, into the proposals um, and yeah, look at them. So the first question from Yanis is, according to your proposals, Ben, how should the money in climate mitigation be spent? For example, to what extent should it be used for undertaking green public investment? And to what extent should it be used for provision of green subsidies to people and companies? Is the nationalization of utilities and the transportation sector necessary for your proposals? So that's the first question. And then the second question I'm gonna ask uh, both of you to, to answer is, Sarah's second question, which is, it seems that many of the proposals, <clears throat> pardon me, it seems that many of the proposals require forms of international coordination. What is the role of the global working class in fostering international coordination? How can solidarity between the working class in the global south and north be strengthened? And I know Aisha, you spoke about pretty, uh, primarily working on the UK, but you might have some, some insights as well to share. Um, I'm going to throw it to Ben first as well, uh, again, just because of the for the first question on, on the green subsidies or green climate change proposals. Great, yeah. Um, oh, I think on the exact breakdown, I mean, I haven't done research on it, but the report that comes to mind is at least for the global north. I mean, we need to think about this is there's going to have to be different types of money. The, 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 what we spend money on is going to be different across the world, yeah? So for example, in Europe, a lot of the money is going to be going into uh, effectively insulating houses and things, like kind of quite boring stuff, but like really, like really necessary stuff. And if you want to see some of the costings on that, you know, how much is this going to actually cost? Uh, there's a report by Raphael Vildauer and Stuart Leach, who are two academics from Greenwich, who look at what you'd actually need for a European Green New Deal. You know, where would the money go? And I think that the, the main thing they say is actually investing in the existing stock and infrastructure. Now for the Global South, that's gonna be, that is gonna be uh, a, a different thing. You know, um, it's gonna, be less based on kind of uh, updating 19th century buildings and more into hopefully, you know, being able to fund social welfare programs, being able to skip out stages of the development process so that you can move straight to uh, renewable energy rather than having to kind of entrench uh, more fossil fuel in infrastructure. So yeah, that would be my, that would be my response to that question. Do you have something for the second as well, or just for? Um, how do we build international coordination? I, I mean, I guess I can talk a little bit from my experience of setting up this tutoring agency. I mean, it's such a micro thing, but I think we have to really be thinking like micro as well. I mean, the basis of that is we, uh, we there's tutors in the global south who um, are part of the cooperative, they teach language courses, they teach uh, other types of courses, and they get paid effectively a global minimum wage within the cooperative. So everyone in the company gets paid the same amount. And the idea is it's about redistribution, redistributing resources within an organization um, that could kind of as a base, like could act as a, as a kind of example of how other organizations and other corporation, corporations could work. Now that, 
I, I see, you know, this is really like, the aim is to build solidarity across national lines and to have a, we also have like a pay where you can afford um, system so that basically people pay according to how much wealth and income they have. So we've been trying out examples and proposals like that. Uh, I think I'll let, I should uh, talk a little bit more about maybe the more macro side of things, yeah. Because that that's, I mean, I'm not saying that this tuition agency is gonna grow and take over take over all of global capitalism. Well, we'll see. Um, we'll see. Over to you, Aisha. Yeah, I think it probably is actually quite a micro example as well. In, in general, I think that in order to kind of build better international solidarity, there needs to be kind of a, a, a more concerted effort to raise a kind of collective political consciousness, whether that's a class consciousness or otherwise. And I can certainly speak to an example from the Black Liberation Movement in the work that I do with, with KIN, which is, a, which is an international network of Black activists. And generally our work there is kind of focused on, on that issue, on kind of raising a kind of sense of, a, of an international um, black, black diasporic political identity, really, and interrogating what that might look like. And so every year we do this kind of annual convening where we bring people together from all over the world and um, with at least 50% coming from the global south. And our approach to that essentially is to kind of leverage our privilege and resources here in, um, in the UK and we also organize in, in Europe and the US um, to essentially raise money from philanthropic organizations, trusts and foundations, um, and then kind of attempt to redistribute those resources by using it to pay the costs of people to come from the global south to the events, um, which includes everything from kind of paying for visas to um, like, you know, all the material costs of, of flights and uh, and stuff like that. And, and it tends to mean that we have, we're able to kind of have a much more representative and I think, you know, effective conversation about global black solidarity because we have such a heavy representation of people um, from all over the world where obviously um, blackness looks different and takes on and, and anti blackness also takes on different manifestations. I think um, it is kind of the responsibility of people living in countries with with um, more resources that they've extracted from the global south to try and, and I guess close that loop by through these redistributive practices. Um, but I think one of the things that's particularly difficult about it, as we find at Kin, is that there are so many uh, kind of racist, colonial, but generally oppressive kind of barriers um, enacted to make that difficult. So, for example, um, I think 20% of the people that we accepted onto the King convening last year couldn't get in because they had visas denied or they were turned away at the border or one of them was even put into detention when they arrived. So, and that's just, just basically because of being identified as a political activist who is black from a country in the global south. So it's also just incredibly difficult to do that work. And the last thing I would say is, of course, COVID has emphasized the ways in which it might be more um, possible because of doing things online to do some of that kind of international solidarity work. But we are then also faced with the question of kind of digital poverty and, and how to redress that. So it's complex, but I think there are things that can and should be done. Thank you, thank you both. We have eight minutes left and I'm gonna push two more questions on you because they're two questions and narratives that kind of go hand in hand. Um, and you've both sort of touched upon, uh, like Ben, you mentioned that it's all about also showing that we have the resources and part of the things have to been done before. Um, and so the first question I'm gonna give you is the first question from Sarah Stevano, which is, do you think that a narrative on the responsibilities for and causes of the pandemic could be useful for informing proposals on how to pay for the pandemic globally? Uh, and the second question is from Alice, who says, um, Aisha really helpfully highlighted some of the unhelpful yet dominant narratives in the UK and elsewhere about the economy and bal balancing the budget, etc. I wonder if you could provide some reflections on how we as citizens and activists can work to reshape these narratives. Um, I mean, you can fight about who goes first. If someone, someone has an immediate. I, yeah, I mean, I, I, just because we literally wrote this report, so it's all quite fresh in my mind in terms of, uh, particularly on the second one, how we might reshape 
some of the narratives. I think at the New Economy Organizers Network where I work, there's a whole section of the organization dedicated to this. Um, and one of the things that we have found incredibly useful um, is around kind of trying to move away from metaphors that invoke you know, uh, this kind of idea of, of the economy as, as a bucket, which crucially we can't control. And it's something that kind of exists out there and that we we have no say in um, in who puts into the bucket or, or who takes out of it and how soon things will run out and, and whatever. And that um, metaphor and that way of thinking about the economy has really far reaching implications for everything from tax policy to um, welfare spending, like it really limits what's possible. And I think what we found to be really effective is um, trying to re reframe it around the idea of the economy as, for example, a computer. Um, and we've kind of tested this metaphor of, you know, the, the economy is a computer and uh, uh, the, the kind of logins or the passwords have at the moment been kind of stolen and they're being used, you know, by some bad actors to, to program the entire system to make it just work for them. And what we actually need to do is kind of get access to those passwords, reprogram the whole thing and make it work for everyone. And that's something that we found with the focus interviews, focus groups that we did and interviews that people could really get behind, like, and it really started to shift. So when we then asked them questions about things like welfare spending, um, foreign aid policy and things like that, they were kind of able to see it as something like, oh, okay, yeah, well, if we did have the codes to the computer, we could put a bit more in that pot or we could change this or we could do that. And they felt so much more empowered and like they had ownership rather than when we asked them those questions before offering them that, that metaphor, they were very much like, well, there's nothing that we can do and there's only a certain amount of resources. So therefore much more inclined to be quite anti-progressive in the, in the policies that they would be on board with. So that's just one example, but I would really encourage folks to kind of to pick up that report, um, which I'd put a link to in the chat because it has a bunch of other ones as well. Maybe I'll answer the other question then, uh, which, if I understood it correctly is, you know, should we be using a narrative around the, like, should we be kind of thinking about the causes of the pandemic or at least the people that have like profited during the pandemic as a way of focusing our proposals? I think it's a good place to start, but it's not gonna go far enough basically. So definitely the pandemic exposes some of the problems that existed before as, as we both discussed. I mean, one clear one is wealth inequality, yeah, which I guess I spoke quite a lot about in the report because that's also what I'm doing some of my research on. Now, you if you just focus a policy based on the wealth inequality that has been created since the pandemic, you're, you're not going to get particularly, you know, you're not going to be able to really tackle the underlying issue because we know that wealth inequality has been rising since the 1980s. That said, we can, you know, you see the fact that some of the kind of shocking stats around wealth inequality that come out during the pandemic, I think do cut through to people and that can be used as a basis to then argue for wider wealth taxes. I mean, the classic, uh, one of the classic things that I've heard repeated is the fact that if Jeff Bezos gave $100,000 to every single Amazon employee since uh, so if Jeff Bezos gave $100,000 to every single Amazon employee, he would still have more wealth than he would have at the start of the year. So there's just like some insane, you know, you can use something like that, the fact that there's been this kind of billionaire bonanza to show people that clearly the system is unfair and unjust and needs tackling. But I think we need to go beyond just saying, let's tax the windfall profits of the wealthy because we want you know we need to be taxing the accumulation of wealth at the top that has exist, existed before that um and i think you could say a similar stuff for corporation uh corporations as well you know we should be using this as an opportunity to build something much more long lasting than just like these windfall ideas great Thank you. Thank you both. Um, okay, there's one question that hasn't been answered. And I think maybe Ben, you can answer that really quickly. And then I will end this whole thing immediately afterwards. Um, which is Yanis' second question, where he just asks, will the value of the estimated financing needs be lower if the multiplier effects of government spending on income and tax revenues is taken into account? Yes or no? 
the tax revenues will be higher, <laughs> I would say. Again, like the dynamics of this stuff is like, it's going to be hard to model. Some of the taxes or some of the proposals are going to affect the revenues from the other ones. You know, if you tax a financial transaction tax and a wealth tax on the richest people who predominantly hold financial assets, both of those assets are being taxed twice. Can you really do that? I think you can in the way that I've set it out, but it might have some kind of reduction in the tax receipts that I've, or in the, the proposals to raise money that I've, I've set out. That said, I haven't even thought about, you know, I haven't put in the multiplier effect. So that I think would, would increase the amount of economic activity and therefore GDP and therefore tax receipts that we would, we would get. So it'd be an interesting thing to look into. I know Yanis is into like modeling, so maybe he can teach me how, how that could be, how that could be done. <laughs> Great, um, future collaboration probably, or hopefully can work there. Um, right, that concludes the session for today. I'm just, before you all leave, I'm gonna mention the like next week's webinar, which will be on uh, the flexible seamstress, global South suppliers and the new economic imperialism. It will be uh, same time, same place. Um, and the speaker will be uh, Intan Suwandi, who is the author of Value Change, Value Chains, The New Economic Imperialism, and is from Illinois State University. And the discussant will be Susan Newman from Open University. And then all that remains is to say thank you to all the questions. And obviously, a huge thank you to both Ben and Aisha for their important and interesting presentation slash intervention. Um, I've one learned a lot uh, and have all the energy to go <laughs> do something active um, to make sure that we go to a just transition from here. So thank you everyone and thank you to the organizers everything. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Bye all. Bye. 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 <laughs>